Chapter 4. What Mr. Brown and Mrs. Grimsby said. My dad used to say that if you really, really want something, you have to keep on trying for it. And since he always used to say that, he had everything he could ever want. I guess he must have known all about trying for things. I knew that I wanted to be friends with Amit. I didn't really know why. I just did. I gave up on trying to speak to him during the day because all of the seclusion he needed. But I figured after school was okay because Mrs. Cann had smiled at me and winked that first time. So every day for two whole weeks, I waited by the school gates at home time. As soon as the new boy and Mrs. Kang came out to meet the woman in the red scarf, I would run over and give the new boy a lemon sherbet, and sometimes a whole chocolate bar. But no matter how many sweets I gave him, or how much Mrs. Kang encouraged him to talk to me, the new boy never said a word, and he never, ever smiled back. Not even when I gave him a whole packet of white mice, which are my favourite. He just quietly took the sweets and, staring at the floor, went and stood behind the woman in the red, red scarf, as if he needed to hide from me. Maybe he doesn't like sweets, said Michael on the Friday of the second week. Don't be silly, said Josie, chewing on her hair. Everyone likes sweets. Maybe he's allergic, said Tom. I'd never heard of anyone being allergic to chocolate and sweets before. But then again, I was allergic to dogs when no one else was, so maybe he was right. After that, I decided to give the new boy my lunch fruit instead of my sweets. He was still going to his seclusion every lunchtime. So on the Monday of the third week of trying to be his friend, I took the biggest orange I could find from the school canteen and waited by the gates. I was extra excited because I had drawn a smiley face on the skin and Tom had given me a sticker of a dinosaur to stick on it. So that was two things that made the orange extra special. Tom loves collecting stickers. He has books and books and books of them at home, and whenever he gets a new one he likes, he always brings it in to show us. I've never seen him give a sticker away to someone he doesn't know very well, so I hoped the new boy would like it and know how special it was. But as we were waiting for the new boy to come out, we heard something about him that we didn't understand at all. In fact, it was even more confusing than learning of confusing the learning about the seclusion he was being given. There were lots of grown-ups standing behind us at the gates. There always are at home time. Sometimes they talk about the news or what they're making for tea, but mostly they talk about the weather. I don't know why, because there's nothing more boring than talking about something everyone else can see for themselves. But I guess that's why you're meant to do it when you become a grown-up. Usually we don't listen because we have more interesting things to talk about, like what we're going to watch as soon as we get home and who our favourite Olympic athlete is or our favourite footballer is. But this afternoon, just after someone had said how sunny it was and wasn't it lovely and how they hoped it would be sunny again tomorrow, someone else said, have you heard about the new refugee kid that's joined the school? He's been put in Mrs. Can's class. They can't find an assistant that speaks his language. Poor little blighto. Josie and Michael and Tom all looked over at me and I looked back at them and then we stood very still together. I knew we were all thinking the exact same thing because our faces frowned exactly the same time. We were wondering what a refugee kid was doing in our class. Then the lady who had talked about the sun said, it'll cause trouble, you mark my words. They're only coming over to take our jobs. Carefully, so that no one else would see us, we looked over our shoulders and saw that it was Mr. Brown and Mrs. Grimsby who were talking. Mr. Brown shrugged and then said, If he's from that awful war on the news, then I feel sorry for the kid. Can't blame him for wanting to get out of that death trap. Hmm, said Mrs. Grimsby. A bother, the whole lot of them. Wouldn't trust one as far as I could throw him. Just you wait and see. It's our kids who'll suffer just because these ones are coming over to do whatever they like. I could tell that Mr. Brown didn't like what she was saying because he frowned and shook his head and then took a step to the side. I like Mr. Brown. He's Charlie's dad. Charlie's one of the boys in upper school. 
Everyone knows who he is because he always steals at least three puddings from the pudding tray every lunchtime, so there's never enough to go round. He's also famous for setting off the fire alarm to get out of a science test. He's always getting in trouble. But I don't think Mr. Brown knows about that because whenever he cries out, Charlie, my old boy, whatever you been up to today? And Charlie says, nothing. Mr. Brown beams at him. Charlie tells everyone that his dad is a boxer, but I don't think that can be true. He has a long beard, and if a boxer was fighting him, if I was a boxer, boxer and I was fighting him, I'd just pull his beard all the time and then win. I looked to the right over at Mrs. Grimsby, her face all sour and pink and angry, and I decided I didn't like her very much. She's the grandmother of a girl called Nellie who's in the year below us. Nellie's one of the most popular girls in school, mainly because she's won every burping competition the school's ever had. She can even burp sing famous songs and is always challenging everyone to try and beat her. I was looking up at Mrs. Grimsby and thinking about all the things she said when Josie suddenly poked me on the arm. Look! When I looked back through the railings, Mrs. Can and the new boy were in the playground and already talking to the woman with the red scarf. So I ran just as fast as I could and gave the new boy the special orange. As usual, he didn't say thank you and he didn't smile, but I saw his eyes widen when he saw the drawing of the smiley face and the sticker on the orange. And for the first time, he looked up at me with his lion eyes and he didn't look away. I knew right away that he wasn't frightened of me anymore. I stared back and gave a small smile. I wanted him to know that it didn't matter if he was a refugee kid. I still wanted to be his friend. I think he must have understood because he gave me a nod that no one else could see. I wished he'd smiled back because you can only ever know that a person is really your friend when they like you enough to smile back at you. But it was okay because the nod felt like a promise and I knew that I wouldn't have to wait too long before the smile followed.